The last war that China won was the Xinhai Revolution, and the only reason it was victorious was because China was fighting against itself. It's this war that led to the founding of the People's Republic of China that exists today. However, if we go back in time, the Chinese military rarely fared well in armed conflicts against foreign powers, and a lot of mistakes have been made by Chinese soldiers, generals, and leaders. We're going to take a look at some of the worst Chinese military mistakes in history. However, its biggest shortcoming might not be what you think. We're going to take you on a journey through China's past military blunders in the order in which they happen. In some of these wars, China fared worse than others, but the common thread is that the Chinese military lost each one and there were devastating consequences for the Chinese people as a result. The failure to conquer territory in some situations and protect the homeland in others has led to China losing battles and wars that could have been won with a little more strategic planning. The First Opium War the Opium Wars were a result of Chinese leadership trying desperately to stop the opium trade within its borders. Unfortunately for China, opium was extremely popular in Europe and was the largest export to Asia for countries like Britain and France at the time. By 1820, much of the population in China was either using or involved with opium in some way. The widespread addiction and connection to the drug led to the Chinese government cracking down on the opium trade, and in the spring of 1839, 20,000 chests of the drug were destroyed or confiscated by the government at a British warehouse in Guangzhou. Around 1,400 tons of opium were destroyed, unsurprisingly angering the Brits who were hoping to sell it for a hefty profit. Around this time, the First Opium War began, and China made some serious military mistakes that would cost them the war and lead to the deaths of thousands of Chinese soldiers and civilians. The following year, in 1840, British forces defeated China's Qing military in a series of campaigns. This was because Qing forces were not properly equipped or prepared to go up against the British. Throwing Chinese troops at an enemy force would be a common threat in military mistakes made by the Chinese over the coming decades. Knowing that the British had the most formidable navy in the world, China's leaders should have focused on protecting major waterways and ports. However, Beijing seemed to let the British command major channels and rivers without putting up much of a fight. Unfortunately for China, it didn't have the ships or the technology to stand up against the British Navy, and its ground soldiers were useless in naval battles. As the war progressed, the British Navy destroyed the Chinese blockade along the estuary where the Pearl River, now known as the Zhujiang, empties into the South China Sea near Hong Kong. The British fleet traveled up the river to Guangzhou, where they attacked and eventually occupied the city in May 1841. The British continued to win victory after victory as the Qing military struggled to keep the invading force at bay. The Chinese soldiers were dedicated and gave their lives to protect their homeland, but they were not as well trained or as well equipped as the British. The Qing leadership knew this, but continued to throw its soldiers at the British in hopes that they would somehow push the enemy out of their borders. This was a mistake that would cost the Chinese government and its people in the end. A hasty counterattack was launched by the Chinese troops in the spring of 1842, but the British held their ground and used the opportunity to take the culturally and economically significant city of Nanjing. This led the Chinese leadership to seek peace, resulting in the Treaty of Nanjing. China was forced to pay Britain for the losses it sustained while also surrendering Hong Kong to British control. The number of ports that Britain could trade with increased from one to five, and since the British won, opium would once again flow between China and Europe. The First Opium War was a huge military failure for China, eventually leading to Britain wanting more influence in the region. To understand just how badly the First Opium War went for China, we can look at some key statistics. Around 20,000 British troops and allies were sent to China to fight. The Qing military consisted of approximately 200,000 troops, half of which were mobilized for the war. In hindsight, the Qing leadership should have probably utilized more of their forces to push the British out of their territory. It's estimated that the British forces sustained around 800 casualties, of which only about 70 died in battle. China, on the other hand, lost 3,100 men and 4,000 others were injured. These numbers clearly show that the Chinese military was out of their depth and some significant changes needed to be made to the tactics they used. The Second Opium War Unfortunately for China, their military wouldn't fare much better in the Second Opium War. Before this war even kicked off, due to a series of unfortunate events, the Qing government had to contend with a rebellion. In 1851, a man by the name of Hong Juquan declared himself the brother of Jesus Christ and started his own brand of religion known as Taiping Christianity. Juquan started a revolution in southern China by uniting ethnic minority groups who felt overtaxed and oppressed by the Qing rulers. The Taiping Rebellion began in January in the southern province of Guangxi. An army of 10,000 men led by Fang Yunshuan and Wei Changhui 
attacked Qing forces in Jintian, in present-day Guiping Guanxi. The rebel army surprised the Qing forces, known as the Green Standard Army, and pushed them out of the region. When Qing units tried to launch a counterattack, it was successfully repelled by the Taiping army. With every battle its troops won, the Heavenly Kingdom's message spread and more people joined the Taiping Rebellion. The British saw the distracted Qing military as being even weaker than before and used the rebellion to further expand its influence in the region. Britain once again renewed hostilities against the Chinese, and the Qing leadership found itself fighting two wars simultaneously. Their first mistake in this conflict was treating ethnic minorities as lower-class citizens and subjugating populations throughout southern China. However, if the Qing leadership had not conceded so much to the British after the First Opium War, giving them a taste of future riches that could be pulled from the Chinese territory, perhaps the British wouldn't have almost immediately jumped at the chance to attack when the Qing military was focused elsewhere. Regardless, the Second Opium War would be another military blunder by the ruling Qing dynasty. In October of 1856, the British once again sailed up the Pearl River and sieged Canton. When the British couldn't break the stalemate between its forces and the Chinese, they collaborated with the French to bolster their numbers. Once France joined the fight, it was only a matter of time before Canton fell, which happened in 1857. The Europeans deposed the leadership and installed officials who were more sympathetic to their cause. Eventually, the British and French forces reached Tianjin, and the Qing were once again forced to enter negotiations that would not go in their favor. New ports were opened to European traders and residences in Beijing were given to foreign envoys. However, the biggest win for the Europeans and a huge blow to the Chinese leadership is that by the end of the Second Opium War, the drug would become formally legalized. This gave European traders easier access to the product that was making them so much money. Although it's almost always a mistake to fight two wars simultaneously, the Qing had very little choice in the matter. The Taiping Rebellion would have torn the country apart, and the encroachment by European powers would not be stopped due to the lucrative opium trade. The Second Opium War resulted in around 2,500 casualties for the Chinese and approximately 700 casualties on the European side. However, the Taiping Rebellion cost the lives of between 20 and 30 million people. Some scholars even suggest that as many as 100 million civilians and soldiers may have died during the Civil War due to famine, disease, and fighting. The Sino-French War just over two decades after the carnage of the Second Opium War and Taiping Rebellion, the Chinese military once again found themselves at war with a familiar foe. But before we find out who they went to war with next, first we want to thank the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. Are you looking for the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made? Then you have to check out War Thunder. In War Thunder, you get to take command of over 2,000 vehicles, from tanks and planes to helicopters and ships that span over a century of development, from the 1920s all the way to modern day. And each is modeled down to their smallest details to make the most realistic and immersive combat experience ever. And War Thunder has one of the most in-depth customization systems for vehicles out there allowing you to apply literally hundreds of different camouflages, historical markings, and 3D decorations that you can apply anywhere on your equipment to truly make each vehicle your own. I loved seeing my own highly customized tank rolling across the battlefield in beautiful 4K resolution, but my favorite part was watching others take actual damage to their vehicle components and crew with War Thunder's Damage X-Ray. So what are you waiting for? Play War Thunder for free right now on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox by using my link in the video description, which gets new players on any platform and those that haven't played in at least six months a large bonus pack that includes limited premium vehicles, an exclusive 3D decorator, and more, but only for a limited time. Now, as we were saying, just over two decades after the carnage of the Second Opium War and the Taiping Rebellion, the Chinese military once again found themselves at war with a familiar foe. The Sino-French War broke out when France began encroaching on the Vietnam territory that China had previously laid claim to. For years, the Vietnamese people had suffered under Chinese oppression and empty promises of modernization. This led to a nationalization movement across the country. So when France promised European infrastructure as well as access to more resources through trade and mild colonization, it seemed like a better deal for the Vietnamese leadership. By 1880, French troops had reached the borders of Chinese-held Vietnam, known as Cochin China. France had been able to defeat Chinese forces in the past alongside the British in the Second Opium War, and it was clear that the Chinese military had continuously made the same mistake of overextending itself. So French leadership concluded that the Chinese military was only a small barrier to overcome in order to secure Vietnam. 
This led to the French pushing further north and moving troops into Hanoi and Haiphong. China tried to be strategic in its response, but like in the past, things didn't always go their way and thousands of Chinese soldiers would die. The Sino-French War was another military defeat in just over half a century. Between 25,000 and 35,000 Chinese troops were sent to Vietnam to protect the territory, but did very little to push France out of the region. In 1882, the great Chinese statesman Li Hongzhang tried to negotiate an agreement to turn Vietnam into a joint protectorate of France and China. However, when French leadership received the proposal, they immediately rejected it and responded by deploying more troops to the area. The Chinese government became overrun by war parties advocating for China to take a more aggressive stance in Vietnam, a decision that would end in tragedy. As more and more reinforcements were sent to the south, France leveraged their superior weapons and technology to fend off wave after wave of Chinese soldiers. Li Hongzhang created a new contract called the Li Fournier Agreement that would allow France to trade throughout the Tonkin region. China would also withdraw its troops from Vietnam in exchange for not having to pay indemnities. However, many in the Chinese government still wanted war and for China to remain the dominant power in the region. This constant push to go to war was a huge error. General Zhang Zidong took command of Chinese forces in Vietnam and enjoyed initial success in his campaigns to the south. However, when the new Chinese fleet of 11 steamers reached the coast of Vietnam, the French quickly destroyed them. In 1885, the Chinese military suffered several major defeats, solidifying the fact that the war parties in Beijing had made a terrible mistake. At the Battle of Hoa Mok, the French 1st Brigade of the Tonkin Expeditionary Corps defeated Black Flag and Yunnan Army's forces. This prevented Chinese soldiers from reaching the French outpost at Tu Yen Quang, which could have been a turning point in the war. When the siege was finally called off and the Chinese forces retreated to the west, around 76 French soldiers had been killed, with Chinese casualties much higher. The Sino-French War ended when a peace treaty was signed in Paris in 1885. China agreed to recognize the Li Fournier Agreement and provided France with trade opportunities throughout much of Vietnam. China was also forced to remove its armies from the region. The First Sino-Japanese War The 1800s was a rough century for the Chinese military. It seemed as if the country was constantly at war with either colonial powers or other powers in Asia. In 1894, conflict erupted between Japan and China. Japan had been looking to modernize and simulate the success of European colonization. They had their sights set on mainland Asia and believed China was not nearly as powerful as they claimed, which turned out to be true. Civil unrest, poor leadership, and constant war had taken a toll on China. This spelt bad news for Korea, one of China's most important tributary territories, as it contained a vast amount of coal and iron that was vital to modernizing the region. Japan knew Korea could also serve as a staging ground for future invasions from the mainland to their islands. If Japan was to continue to grow its power and influence, it needed to expand its borders, and Korea's location and natural resources made it the perfect territory to colonize. In 1875, Japan began influencing politics in Korea to allow for more lucrative trade opportunities. Tokyo then began to support radical forces within the Korean government that wanted to push the country toward modernization while the Chinese backed the conservative officials who were more closely aligned with their own desires. Things started to go from bad to worse when pro-Japanese reformers tried to overthrow the Korean government in 1884. This led to China sending in troops led by General Yuan Shikai to rescue the Korean king, but resulted in the deaths of several Japanese legation guards. War was narrowly avoided and things in Korea remained relatively stable for a decade. Then in 1894, while Japan's modernization program was in full swing, China assassinated a pro-Japanese revolutionary vying for power in the Korean government. This enraged the Japanese leadership. When the Tonghak Rebellion broke out in Korea and China sent troops to squash the rebellion, Japan responded by sending 8,000 of their own soldiers. Japan also managed to sink the British steamer Koshing carrying China's reinforcements. This attack only heightened the tensions between the two nations. On August 1, 1894, war between Japan and China officially was declared. Many believe that since China had a much larger military, it would be able to secure an easy victory. However, like the mistakes in the past, China relied too heavily on numbers and not enough on sound tactics. China did not take into consideration how rapidly Japan had modernized. Having better equipment, ships, and weapons, Japan began to win overwhelming naval and land victories, shocking the Chinese leadership and the rest of the world. The Japanese quickly defeated Chinese forces at the Battle of Pungdo, Battle of Songwon, and the Battle of Pyongyang, where approximately 2,000 Chinese soldiers were killed, while Japan only lost around 150 men. At the Battle of the Yalu River, 12 Japanese ships defeated 14 Chinese vessels, 
China suffered another 1,350 casualties, while Japan's losses were closer to 380 troops. Chinese forces didn't fare much better as the fighting continued into the next year. At the Battle of Wei Highway, Qing forces lost 4,000 men, had one battleship captured, and another scuttled. China also had six torpedo boats destroyed and another seven captured in this single battle. The Battle of Yinkyo led to the end of major combat during the First Sino-Japanese War. 55,800 Japanese troops and over 100 artillery guns were used to attack the bulk of Chinese forces, which numbered between 40,000 and 60,000. Additionally, 5,700 Chinese soldiers were killed, with another 6,000 being taken captive by the Japanese. During the battle, the Japanese lost less than 1,000 men. It was a total and utter defeat for the Chinese military. They had greatly underestimated their enemy, which was evidently a big mistake. The same tactic of relying on superior numbers rather than sound military strategy and modernization once again cost China the war. With so much success in Korea, Japan decided to take the fight to China. By March of 1895, Japan had invaded Shandong province and Manchuria. The Japanese navy and ground forces were quickly approaching Beijing. China sued for peace, and the Treaty of Shimonoseki was ratified, which ended the war. China was forced to pay indemnity and give Japan trading rights within Chinese territory. The tragic part for China was that it had yet to win a major conflict during the 19th century, which led Western powers to seek even more concessions from the nation as there was nothing they could do about it. The Chinese military was weak even if it had superior numbers. The century-long defeat of Chinese forces led to reform within the country as revolutionary activity against the Qing dynasty began. The Second Sino-Japanese War while the Western world recovered from the horrors of the First World War, another conflict began to brew between Japan and China. Japan continued to modernize and spread its influence in Asia throughout the early 20th century. China was rightfully concerned by this and looked to resist Japanese expansionist policies. For most of the early 1900s, Japan maintained control of Manchuria. A significant part of the Manchurian population was recognized as being Chinese, even though most were actually of Manchu descent. And in order to gain sovereignty over its own territory, China began to take a more aggressive stance against the Japanese colonial practices. Between 1931 and 1932, Japan had enough of China standing in the way of its expansionist dreams. Japanese forces seized the city of Mukden and established the puppet state of Manchukuo. By the spring of 1934, it became clear that Japan was no longer satisfied with only controlling territory north of the Great Wall and declared all of China a Japanese preserve. Tokyo stated that China could no longer take action or make decisions without the consent of Japan. By 1937, China could no longer accept Japanese aggression on the mainland. A minor conflict along the Marco Polo Bridge close to Beijing started on July 7, 1937, as the result of a, quote, misunderstanding. However, this small battle quickly escalated into the Second Sino-Japanese War, when it became clear that China would not just bow to Japanese demands. The nationalists and the communists in China found a common enemy in the Japanese and put their differences aside for the time being to fight as a united front. This bolstered Chinese military numbers, but like in past conflicts, China would find that large numbers don't win wars. Due to political unrest and the oppressive nature of Japanese policies in the region, Beijing had not invested nearly enough time or resources into modernizing its military, making it ill-equipped to fight a war. When the conflict started, Japanese forces rapidly dispatched Chinese opposition. It only took two years for Japan to capture most of China's ports and major railways. By 1937, Chinese forces had been pushed out of Shanghai, and in December, Nanjing, the nationalist capital, fell to Japan. The occupation of the city and the decimation of its population by the Japanese would become known as the Nanjing Massacre. Around 300,000 Chinese civilians were slaughtered by Japanese troops. After the fall of Nanjing, Japanese forces dominated China. They took Canton, Shanxi, and Inner Mongolia. Chinese defense was ineffective in almost every battle. Its military had no control over the sea or air, as Chinese technology was so far behind the modernized Japanese forces. China's losses were staggering, but the nation's size and large population allowed it to endure much longer than the Japanese had anticipated. Every time Japanese forces would close in on a location of the Chinese leadership, they would pack everything up and move further west. This eventually led to a stalemate. China's tactics theoretically kept them from losing the Second Sino-Japanese War, but at the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives and millions of people wounded. By the time World War II broke out, nationalist China had run into serious economic and social problems as Japan occupied much of the country. And there was unrest among the Chinese people. 
Once again, rather than focusing on its citizens, the Chinese leadership poured everything into the war effort even though it had very little chance of succeeding. This led to a massive number of refugees fleeing west, runaway inflation, and a general bad time for the civilians within China's borders. Malnutrition ravaged the population, and the Chinese people lost faith in their government. There was no good option for China when Japan became aggressive, but the mistakes and missteps that the nationalist government made led to large amounts of pain and suffering for the Chinese population. When more and more support for communism arose in China, the government instituted oppressive measures to try to suppress the movement. This was another mistake that had ramifications for both the war and the country as a whole. The Communist Party gained more control as the result of nationalist crackdowns, and its armies grew. Like in the Second Opium War, the Chinese military was about to be faced with a war against its own people and a foreign invader. Clashes between the nationalist forces and communist forces began throughout the region, all while Japanese occupied much of the country. The inability of China to remain unified even during one of its bloodiest wars in history shows how poor leadership may have been one of its biggest weaknesses. The main reason China was eventually able to reclaim the territory occupied by Japan was because of the intervention of the United States. As the war in the Pacific erupted in 1941, the US began sending supplies to China from India. The US trained Chinese soldiers and engineers. However, Chinese forces had been diminished to the point that they played a relatively small role in pushing Japan out of mainland Asia. Modern Day On October 1, 1949, the People's Republic of China was formed. Since then, China has not participated in a major war. We'll circle back to this fact as being one of the military mistakes of the current Chinese leadership. That being said, China was involved in some very minor conflicts. Early in the morning of October 23, 1962, the sun rose over the hilltops of the Himalayas. Indian soldiers heard the far-off sound of artillery fire echoing off the cliff faces. Shells exploded along the line of actual control between Chinese-controlled Tibet and India. A contingent of Chinese soldiers approached the border and began to fire at the Indian border guards. This was a poorly planned attack, but it appeared at the time that China was ready to start a full-blown war with India. The Indian soldiers were overrun, 17 men died, and 13 more were captured by the Chinese invasion force. The remaining Indian soldiers fell back to the nearby Buddhist monastery at Tawang, which the Chinese attacked the following day. Small skirmishes broke out across the region. Indian soldiers tried to mount a resistance, but the mountains made this area incredibly hard to reach. The Chinese soldiers continued to march south toward Assam, one of the region's wealthiest and most important settlements. Just under a month after Chinese forces crossed the line of actual control, they retreated back to their side of the border. On November 21, 1962, the Chinese declared a ceasefire, and the war to control the Himalayas came to a swift end. At the time, it seemed China would be successful in occupying Arunachal Pradesh. They had taken numerous mountain villages and towns, so the Indian military couldn't believe their luck when the Chinese military just gave up, for no apparent reason. 1,383 Indian soldiers were killed in the brief war, and around 1,700 went missing in the treacherous landscape of the Himalayan mountains. Chinese records indicate their forces had killed 4,900 Indian soldiers and citizens and captured another 3,968. However, the actual numbers are likely somewhere between the two nations' reports. To this day, no one except for the Chinese government knows why their troops were recalled. Maybe they had other plans, or perhaps the Chinese military thought they had overextended themselves and couldn't resupply its own troops. Yet, even though the Chinese could have taken the Arunachal Pradesh region of India in 1962, they didn't, which seems odd as there would be continued fighting along the border for decades to come. China also briefly invaded Vietnam in 1979 for 29 days. However, no territory was seized or any major changes made to the borders or geopolitics in the region as a result of the Chinese military action. We've now come to the worst military mistake in recent Chinese history. It's not that Chinese leadership has made exceedingly bad decisions or thrown its soldiers into the meat grinder like in the 19th century. Instead, it has to do with the fact that China has not been in a major conflict since World War II. We're not condoning warmongering or saying that countries should constantly be at war. But there is no denying that militaries such as the United States have a lot more experience in warfare than China does. China rarely takes part in UN peacekeeping missions, and since it has remained relatively isolated in terms of military alliances, its joint operations and training have been limited as well. China's worst military mistake of the modern era is that its troops are likely not prepared to fight a war. A lack of wartime knowledge greatly hinders the effectiveness of the Chinese military. 
Could their unwillingness to engage in past conflicts or work more closely with nations with experience in fighting wars, such as is done with the NATO alliance, be China's biggest military mistake when it comes to future wars? Only time will tell. It's not out of the realm of possibility that if China does end up going to war over Taiwan or any other border dispute, it may fall back on its old tactic of throwing as many troops at the enemy as possible without strategic planning or consideration for their opponent's capabilities. As history has shown, this tactic has not worked out great, yet China's made this very same mistake repeatedly. Thanks again to the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. Don't forget to click the link in the description where new and returning players can get a large bonus pack with multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive 3D decorator, and more. But hurry, it's only available for a limited time. Now watch how Mexico is taking over China's manufacturing, or check out why China will never be a global superpower.